We're back in action. How you doing? What's up, man? How are you? Hey, just another day in the office, brother. It's been a good week. Lots of good shit happening inside the company, inside the family world. Um, learn lots of lessons, you know, another day in the office. Have you come across like the mentality of, um, if things are going great or things are going not so great, but you show up either way and give it the same effort every day? <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> All time, <laughs> right? Yeah. So wh why is that? Is it because you're passionate about what you do or is it like, what, why, why, where does that come from? Well, Mark Cuban says, show up as if someone is out there working 24 seven to beat you up, you know? And so, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. so like, it's, it's important that you, you show up and put a, your all, especially when you don't feel like it. And, and I think, um, like that's where discipline comes in, you know, and that's where like disciplined people are the people that actually accomplish uh, big things. But, um, I don't know. I mean, what about you? I mean, how, how, how do you show up? Yeah, man. I mean, that's something that I think a lot of people struggle with. And I've definitely been in that camp. I think it's part of being the human experience. Some days you're not motivated and you don't feel like it, but I think the difference between people who fucking get results and they get where they want to go, show up regardless of how they feel. Yes. Right. And like Tony says it all the time, sponsored by Tony. Tony says it all the time. He says, I don't fucking negotiate with my mind and my brain and what it's telling me, I know what I need to do and I just fucking execute on it. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, when you're going through good times, a lot of times you want to sit back mm -hmm. when you're going through bad times, you want to fucking hide, yep. but that's when you need to step in and be like, no, I know what I need to get done. and I'm going to do it. You know what? There was a time, actually, I, I, I remember this very clearly. There was a time when I was a child, I used to always hide when there were, like, problems happening. Um, so I grew up in a family where, like, there was just, there was just a lot of, like, trouble. You know, my, like, my, my older brother's always fighting. My mom and sister always fighting. My sister had a, had a, a boyfriend in college that my mom didn't approve of. And so it was like, just this whole, like, you know, like the, the, the household was just troublesome, you know? And I remember every time there was a problem, what I would do is I would like hide, like literally hide and hope that it's going to be okay whenever I came out. Or like if, let's say if I'm if I'm scared of like uh, thunder or something like that, it's raining outside, I would like hide until it like stopped. And then I can't remember what it was, but I was little where I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Like this time I'm just going to like face it and let's see what's going to happen. And I remember feeling really good. And as Tony says, self-esteem is created not when people tell you you're great, people like pat you in the back. It's when you do something and you show up for yourself and like you actually like prove something for yourself, you know? Has that ever happened to you or have you noticed that? Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, the big one that sticks with me is you create confidence in your ability to succeed when you keep your word to yourself. So when you tell yourself you're going to do something, whether it's something big or small, yes. you have to fulfill on that Ooh, okay. or else you start having this belief that you don't do what you say you're going to do. And it's like a negative spiral. Like when, when, when you were switching from, you know, offline to online or when you were changing the way you were working out or your diet or whatever, did you ever have moments where you were like, okay, I'm just going to do like one small thing at a time and I'm going to tick it off and feel good about it and keep it moving. Did you ever like do that kind of a strategy or think in that way? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is why we always preach like, you know, New Year's resolutions suck and, and don't create a long list of things because you have so many things that you're working towards. And after a while, what's going to happen is you're just going to get demotivated because you keep promising yourself that you're going to do something or not do something. And then you show up the other way. And again, that like builds like you checking off those tasks or whatever is what builds self-esteem, is what builds self-confidence. And so if you keep doing that, you're just going to show up in a way where like you're going to stop trusting yourself. And I think it's very important that we create trust within ourselves. 100%. If you can't trust yourself, you're fucked. Yes. You can put that shit on a quote meme somewhere because yeah. <laughs> it's true. 
if you can't trust yourself, you are fucked because number one, that'll project into other people. You'll believe they're not capable. And if you have a family or you're running a team or you're doing something, the second that you're putting that bullshit in, into their space, that's not good. And if you can't trust yourself, all of a sudden you're going to start this spiral where it's like, oh, you know, I always think of it like dominoes. And so if you find yourself in a position where you're like, you didn't get up on time, you haven't gone to the gym in a bunch of days, you haven't ticked off a bunch of shit. A strategy is actually to look backwards and see what the first domino was and see, well, if I sleep in, then I don't exercise. If I don't exercise, I don't eat well. If I don't eat well, I give up on other shit and it just creates this big spiral, right? So it's like the small things, the small domino, the small hinge that swings a big door are the things to focus on. And these are just little mediocre things every, every day, minimal stuff, right? Like well, what's something you do in the morning that sets you up for your day? That if you miss it, it's just not a big deal. You can still have an awesome day, but these little things help you out. So morning routines have been by far the best thing that I've implemented seven, eight months ago, almost 10 months ago now. But recently, literally the last like three and a half, four weeks is priming, which you did today for the sales team in the, uh, what's it called? And the winning Wednesday meeting. Uh, it's about a 15 minute thing. If you, those of you that are watching, if you go to, to YouTube and just type Tony Robbins priming, it's a 15 minute thing. And it, it, it what it does, it changes your state. It, 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 you know, Tony walks you through these things, um, the, you know, things that's happened in the past that you can be, uh, grateful for, uh, some goals that you want to accomplish in the next three, six, 12 months, uh, you know, people and moments that have happened in your life that could be grateful for that. You could uh, uh, enjoy things that you're proud, moments that you're proud of, and so on. And then he does this like little prayer. And what that does, and then right after, I put on the eye of the tiger. And then I go into this this incantation thing that like he does, you know, in all of his events, like the the gladiator one. There's another one that we did at Day with Destiny. It's called Eye of the Voice. I do four incantations. Two I created, two are from him. And while I'm listening to Eye of the Tiger and I'm like beating on my chest, I'm like doing like moving, you know, physically, you know, and I'm standing on my balcony and I'm pretty sure people think I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, you know? totally. And then, and then after I'm done, I start like pounding on my fist saying yes until the song is done. Like, yes, yes, yes. Again, something I learned from him. And then the whole thing takes maybe like 20 minutes, mm. 20 minutes out of 24 hours. But that puts me in such an incredible state that I can literally, like, eat an army in front of me. You know what I mean? Fuck yeah. Absolutely, dude. State is everything. State is literally everything. But you said something there that's pretty interesting. People probably think I'm fucking crazy. So this is a massive thing, right? Yeah. Like, we always, we always fucking think about what other people are thinking. Yes. Or at least that creeps into our psyche. Yes. What are your thoughts around that shit? Because I know for a lot of people, maybe you watching at home, it's like you're worried about what people are going to think. You're doing this weird thing. You're fucking whatever. I know I've been dealt that shit in my, in my time. How about you? You ever thought about what people thought of you? You know what's interesting is we think that we don't think of what that, people think of us. Yeah. That's the, that's the problem, right? Because up until a long time ago, I did not think I give a shit about what people think. Until I was again at a Tony's event, uh, my head was hurting because of how you know how bright the room was, and I didn't want to wear my glasses because my eyes are sensitive. And uh, one of the coaches was like, "Hey, what's wrong with you?" I was like in the corner, you know, rubbing my head. I'm like, "My, you I know, mean, my head is hurting." He's like, "Do you have sunglasses with you?" I'm like, "I do, but I do want to look like a schmuck wearing sunglasses inside." He's like, "Oh, so you care about what people think about you?" And I looked at her in my head, I'm like. <laughs> Don't fucking coach me right now. I don't feel like you're coaching me. And he's like, I wonder where that shows up in your life. And he walks away. Oh. And I was like, this son of a bitch. You know? Push iron. And then for like, I remember for a month after that, bro, I was thinking about it. And then I started, like right now, just what I just said. I'm like, and I'm pretty sure like people in the ballot, you know, people around me think I'm crazy. No, I'm still doing it. But I know deep down, I'm like, fuck people probably think I'm fucking crazy. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, no, hundred percent. Oh my God. I could go for days on this one. Um, but you know, something that's fucking like a mind bender that kind of got me off of that as much as possible. I think there's always that inside you. I think it's just innate because we're, we're conscious beings. We're Why aware. is that? Though? Why is that? 
I had fucking something to do with staying alive when there was tigers after us or some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some awareness thing, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's definitely not serving us anymore. Um, but the thing that sort of triggered me away from that, because I was in that deep when I was back in the day, just coming on the internet, I was making selfie videos like on Facebook and shit. I'm like, hey man, I'm fucking doing this internet thing and you know, come buy this thing for me or whatever the fuck, right? And I would literally go hide around corners so that my oh, real life you? friends wouldn't see me, my real life friends. Yeah. Cause I'd be like a pool villa with a nice view at a barbecue. I'd be like, oh, this is a fucking great spot for a couple videos. I would go like hide around a corner, make my videos quietly so people didn't look at me. And then I'd go back out to the party and I'd be there. I did that for like half of a year. But see how interesting is that? And see, that's the, the, the mind fuck. Is yes. you're okay with putting yourself out there in front of thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever, millions of people, right? Yeah. But are not okay with putting yourself out there in front of like five, ten people. And that's the thing that I've noticed. Why do you think that is and where does that stem from? I think it's because when you're putting yourself out there to the internet, it's not as tangible. You don't know them personally. You don't see them. You don't talk to them. Maybe you don't as heavily weight their opinion of you because they're not in your immediate social circle. Okay. People in your immediate social circle, psychologically, they could go tell your other friend that you're a dumbass. And then now all of a sudden you're not part of the tribe anymore. And now you go and you die because you're not in the tribe, right? Because you got no food, like old school. But like the people on the internet, you don't know them. You're like, I don't give a fuck what you guys think about me. I don't know any of you guys. I'll never see you in my life. I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff right now and let's just do it, you know? But the, the, the thing that got me off that, and like now you and I, we both obviously don't give a fuck. We're always doing this shit and we just don't care. It's when I realized, and I don't remember who said it, but it was like two things. One, people are not thinking about you as much as you fucking think they are. Yeah. People are not sitting around being like, oh, I wonder what Bashar is up to today. Like, no, they got lives. They got their own shit. Yeah. They think we're thinking about them and we're fucking not. And the other thing is... Think about the most famous person that has like died recently, right? You know what I mean? Think of someone who's passed away recently who was famous as fuck. Okay. Let's just use the Queen of England. Okay. She passed away this year. When was the last time you thought of the Queen of England? I mean, not ever. Whenever I saw something on Instagram by accident or, you know, just by yeah. passing, you know? Yeah, and think of the impact, whether, I mean, this isn't a fucking political debate here, like, about, like, them conquering the world and bullshit. Think of the impact she had on, like, the world. Right. She was the queen of fucking England for, like, 80 years. They took over shit, they got taken over, they got rich, they did this, they did that. The impact she had is so fucking massive, yet here we are, haven't thought about her for a second. Right. Who the fuck's thinking about us? Right. Nobody. And we're all going to die. So just do you. And it took me a minute to get there, man. It did. It really did. You know what's interesting is I've realized that we're the hypocrites in our own life. Oh, yeah. Massively. And what I mean by that is we... Okay, here's an example. I was at a mastermind uh, with Cole Gordon a couple of weeks ago. And everyone in there, there was about like 10, 15 of us. Everyone in there is, I mean, there wasn't anyone that who has a company that doesn't produce five to $10 million a year, minimum, minimum, right? Yeah. And, you know, we're all at the golf tournament, we're hanging out, whatever. And I don't know how we started talking about, uh, uh, the next day we were all flying out. We started talking about trips and planes and all that stuff. And, uh, oh, one of our friends has like a, one of those, like, uh, like, uh, like small planes or whatever. So they were talking about that. And, um, and then everyone was like, oh, I'm flying this, I'm flying that, I'm flying that. I'm like, oh yeah, tomorrow. I'm like, oh shit, I actually got, just got a text message. I got to check in. Um, and then I don't know what I was talking. I'm like, yeah, it's frontier. And then literally there was five people around me. They all stopped and they turned around and looked at me. They're like, you're flying with frontier. I'm like, yeah. They're like, wait. Is that a budget airline? It's like, wait, the, uh? Is that a budget airline in the States? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like a low tier, you know. Gotcha. They're like, uh, they're like, wait, Frontier doesn't have first class. I was like, yeah, I don't fly first class. I fly economy. Yeah. Literally, their fucking jaws dropped, bro. Dropped. Yeah, I bet. And they're like, what the fuck? You don't fly first class? I was like, I don't. 
But why? I'm like, I don't know, I just don't value it. All of my flying is like within, like, you know, it's not like you, you know, you're flying from like Europe to the US or whatever. So you're on yeah, planes like 10, 15 hours. I'm like, my flight is like here, San Diego, Arizona, it's like two to five hours max. And I just don't see the fucking point of spending three times more. I'm standing in the same line. I'm waiting for my bag. I'm like, like if it was like flying private, I would be okay. I'm totally for it. But flying private is like 10, 15 times more. So it's like, okay, that's stupid. You know what I mean? So it's like I don't see the I don't see the value in it, you know. Okay. So yeah, no, I hear you. So that's yeah. Hey, let's, let, let's, let, let me just finish this thought. So that's one for I don't value it, right? I don't value flying private, uh, flying first class. They 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 they, they do. Two seconds later, we're talking about cards. This is something I've never said to anyone, never mentioned it anywhere. This has been like three months. But recently, I bought a very expensive car, and you know about it, right? Yeah. Multiple yeah. six figures. And I casually said what I bought and then went on with conversation and they all stopped and looked at me again. It's like, wait a second, you're not going to just fucking like just say that in passing and move on. What the fuck should I speak to? Should I video? And one of them goes to me, wait a second. So you don't fly first class and don't value it, but yet you have a multi six figure car. I was like, yeah, these are just the things that I value and the things that I don't value. And that's when I stopped and thought about it. I'm like, why is that? Yeah. That's so interesting. It is fucking interesting. And, um, dude, I, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's your values, right? Everyone has a different version of their core values, the things they value and what they find valuable. And that's it. So that's it. There's, there's nothing else to say about that. I guess it does beg the question because it sounds like you guys are talking about money purchasing some sort of a feeling it's like well don't you feel better in first class don't you feel better in your car there's the big fucking question everybody's asking can money buy happiness can it you got a bunch of it you look pretty fucking happy what's up with that have you always been that way or were you happy without money too can money buy happiness the question of all fucking questions yeah that's a good question you know I was uh, I was actually going to send you a picture the other day yeah. I was having a shitty day, and then I, I decided to take a ride. Nice. And then I got in the car, and I was like, fuck, I just got to feel a little better now. <laughs> <laughs> totally, dude. Oh, I mean, look, money, Jim Rohn, right? I say this fucking quote like four times a day. Money's not everything, but it's right up there with fucking oxygen. Everything you have in your life costs fucking money. Everything. Right? This uh, studio, your socks, the fucking computer you're watching this on from home, your phone, right? The water you're drinking, the gas bill to keep you warm. Every fucking thing costs money. So is it important? Absolutely. Is your quality of life better with it? Absolutely it is. If you say no, you haven't experienced that version of life. I can go on for days about this because I lived on an island where people have very little money and they're very happy. But I believe if they had a lot of money and they had opportunities to help their family in different ways with that money and put it into things they value, they would be happier. They're just not aware of it right now. So can money make you happy? Solves money problems. So I 100% agree with you. Here is a different take on this. I think where people will lose or where we'll get into this, this uh, down spiral cycle is when they attach happiness to money. And what I mean by that is, when this, then. No. When I make $10,000 a month, then I will probably be happier. When I, uh, you know, uh, I have a shitty marriage. But I'm pretty sure if I take more, if I make more money, then I'll be able to buy my wife more things and send my kids to private school, blah, blah. Then we will probably be happier. I think that's where the problem happens. Look, as of last Friday, we had been we've been married for five years, Roweda and I. When we first got married, we used to argue a lot. Now we barely argue. And I remember when I look back at when we first got married, a lot of our arguments, not I want to say all of them, but a lot of them had to do something with money. Like, it you know, really go upstream and figure out really why and where did this start? You know, it was always about 
her buying stuff and shoving it in the, you know, buying decorative stuff, and I just don't care about that. But it, it's like, well, that's because we were tight on money, right? Her wanting to go out more and me wanting to work. Okay, but that's because it was about money. You know, like right now, I can afford to step away and go have dinner with my wife. Five years ago, I couldn't because I was a one-man show, right? So I think... As you said, money definitely solve problems in, and can give you joy and can give you tools to to experience life and to do things. Like right now, I you know there's a lot of experiences I would not even dream about five years ago. Um, but I think, and I want to hear what you think. I think um, when we attach our happiness to when we have money and not figure out how we can be happy today. Um, that's, I think, when we can get in trouble. What do you think? Totally. Fucking 100% agree. Um, attaching your happiness to the money is the problem. And this is where a lot of people fall into, myself included, you probably at some point. I think everybody falls into that early until you get some money and or you've done a lot of development and had mentors around you who taught you various things. But again, it's one of those things, people can say it all day long till they're blue in the face, at you, towards you, but until you've learned that in your own, it's almost hard to understand it because there is the truth behind it of, yeah, but the only people you ever hear say that are people who have money, right? It's like Bashar City, you're on a multi six figure car and a big business and he's sitting over here being like, yeah, money just, it doesn't bring you happiness. Don't attach your happiness to it. Yeah, but you got a bunch of it. It's like, yeah, but when you get it, you realize that it's not the material things it can buy you. It's not the watch. It's not even the car. It's the experience and what you value on the other side of it. So for me, it's like when I started making money on the internet, I went from not making any, barely money at all on an island, working in a hotel and doing like events and stuff, great lifestyle, but not very much income, very low income to making pretty decent money online, right? Thanks to BJKU. It was amazing. So completely life-changing. So when I started making money, Yes, we upgraded our lifestyle and absolutely I was happier. I wasn't smiling and laughing more than I was before. My internal happiness was the same, but what made me happy was the fact that I was providing for my family and setting us up for a stable future that made me happy. And that came from the money. It's like, I will buy us good health insurance, right? I will move us to a place that is, has a very good standard of living. If a family member needs money, which has happened a few times, emergencies come up, I can wire that money tomorrow, not a problem. That's happened twice already, right? And it's about to happen again. I just heard something the other day. And it's like, I can help now. Right. So can it make you happy? Fuck yeah, I can, because you can provide for the people around you. Buying shit, no, not really going to make you happy. Unless it sparks a, a value inside you, like leisure, traveling experiences. Hell yeah, that'd make you happy all day long. But that's also monetary, right? That's also like like the the car thing that I'm telling you about. The first couple yeah. of weeks that I got it, I was like, like I mean, it was just flying. And I even now, whenever I dream, I walk up to them like, fuck, this car is sexy, you know? But it's like, I'm not thinking about it all day. It's like, it's a car, you know? It's It kind of like, I don't want to say it's, it's normalized because I don't know if it ever will, but it's, the excitement is not, the excitement of the first like week is not there anymore. You know what I mean? No, totally. It, that, that's what happens with material stuff, right? Yes. It immediately goes away. I can give you an example. I bought a watch uh, three days ago. Mm. Okay, It's not a very expensive watch, a couple of grand, but it's just a nice little watch. It's a classic. I love it. Very excited about it. I looked at it for fucking five hours straight when I got home, and I was like, this is beautiful. Looking at it, wearing it. I wore it two or three days. You know what I fucking ended up doing today? Mm. I was searching for a new goddamn watch. It's like, what the fuck? It's, it hasn't even been a week, <laughs> you know? And I'm already like, oh yeah, well, what's the next one? What's the next one? It's like, that's the trap that you fall into when you think that that's going to make you happy. Mm. And um, material stuff just doesn't. There, there's another side of things though. If you buy something for an experience, right? An experiential, experiential material item, this could be something for leisure, mm. right? It's like, okay, you have two or three kids, and you live on an ocean, it's like, you know what? I would love for them to learn from me how to be like a saltwater fisherman, just as an example. I'm going to buy a fishing boat. I'm going to teach my kids how to fish. We're going to have tons of memories. We're going to celebrate out there. We're going to have birthdays. We can watch the sunset. Take my family out when they come visit. 
that's a materialistic thing that you can buy with money. That is a leisure experience that you sh can buy if you're broke, but it will bring joy to the people around you. Yes. There's the value. And see, that's the theme that I keep hearing from what you're saying. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for other people. Correct. Right? Because that's where fulfillment comes from, is when you are contributing to other people. It's kind of like, like those of you that are watching this, and if you find this valuable, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're probably going to share it with someone that you care about. It's like, hey, man, look at minute, blah, blah, blah. These guys talked about this thing and that thing. Remember we were talking about it the other day? Like, that's the first thing you're going to do, you know, because when we care about, like, when we, when we have great experiences, we want to share them with other people because that's how we're fulfilled. Spot on, dude. That's so spot on. And that, that's a funny thing also. I got myself in some trouble with that because I got very passionate about like crypto and various things back in the day. I shared things that weren't the best pieces of advice because I thought they were good. But I just got so excited about it for myself. I was like, oh my God, I found something amazing. Let me share it with everybody that I know. Right? So there's also danger in, in, in what you share and being aware of like, doing your own due diligence and knowing that what you're sharing is something of quality okay. and is something of value because we want, we have that in, internal drive to share. Yes. That brings us fulfillment. We're helping our fellow man with sharing some knowledge, but I would just caution you out there, double, triple check your due diligence before you share with people you care about. Cause you can fuck yourself up. I've ruined a couple of relationships that way. I feel terrible about it and I can't pull it back ever, you know? Because I just made some bad decisions. I thought I was right. I was wrong. I brought people into it. We all got fucked. And what are you going to do? You can't do shit. You know? So you got to be careful about that stuff. Okay, so then if someone that's watching right now that's, you know, that's wanting to start something or get into crypto or get into Amazon FBA or get into this thing or get into that thing, you know, you hear all the stories of like, you know, someone like... um Mark Zuckerberg, him and a couple of friends got together in a dorm room and launched a business, you know, and now, it, you know, he's worth tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Elon Musk, you know, Elon Musk talks about, uh, Elon Musk, I think it was Elon or Jeff, one of them, were talking about how they were, like, proud that they didn't, um, I think it was uh, Elon Musk, how he didn't have, like, direct mentors or people that, like, taught him, showed him the ropes, you know? And then you have like people like us, uh, Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, you know, Gary Vee. A lot of these guys are always talking about like uh, Jim Rohn, you know, talking about how the best, Warren Buffett, the best investment you can make is in yourself. So someone watching, it's like, well, there's all these courses online and stuff like that. It's probably people are trying to scam me. So I would rather go and try to figure it out on my own because these super successful people have like figured that on their own. What do you think of this? Like, is there a balance? Is there the right way, the wrong way? You know, what, what do you think about that? Dude, I think everything that people want to do out there has been done. Mm. And you'd be fucking stupid to try to figure it out on your own when you know someone else has the blueprint already. Okay. And if they've put enough time and effort in to build a course or some sort of community or some sort of a, uh, a place where you can get coaching directly from them or their community, yes. if you don't, leverage that all you're doing is slowing down the time in which you're successful mm -hmm. and if you slow it down to the point where you fail you might lose your window of opportunity to transition into that business mm -hmm. right so like if you have say two months or three months of savings and you can just be like okay i'm all in on my business and you spend that time fucking fumbling around and you lose that window of opportunity you have to go back to your job or you have to pivot out of it you fucked yourself but if you go and you grab someone who's done it in day one, it's like, tell me all your mistakes. What don't I do here? Thank you. Put that to the side. What do I do? Start on that shit and have them coaching you through it. You can get it done exponentially faster and actually successful. So I think it's the difference between success and failure is having someone who's done it who can teach you. No question. If I could do one thing again differently in any of my endeavors in life, all the way back to being a ski racer, and school and work, all of it, I would have had way more mentors, way more in everything, every aspect of life. What about you? I mean, I have a, a real life experience uh, and, and a very like tangible example because 
when I got into restaurants, that was like the, you know, the second business that I ever had. Um, I was trying to be self-taught, right? Because what I was trying to do is I was watching Bar Rescue. I was, you know, getting on a uh, uh, literally reality TV show trying to learn how to fucking run a restaurant. Like, who the yeah. fuck does that, you know? Oh, boy, exactly. who should, you should have seen me when I watched this, this, this show. I would have my notebook and I'd be like taking notes and stuff like that. And, um... And then looking back at like when I started selling on Amazon, again, did the same thing. Started watching a bunch of YouTube videos and then tried to implement and then lost, you know, like seven, eight thousand dollars in three failed products. And it wasn't until and that that was like my aha moment is when I took a course. It was the shittiest course that I've ever taken in my life. But it, it literally was like three simple things. It was like an eight hour course. I literally, you know, went through it all in, in an afternoon. But it was three simple things. That I was like, holy shit. Had I known this, as you said, I would have accelerated my learning curve. I would have probably launched three successful products instead of failed products. Now, and then the other thing is, like, as you said, is you not only do you lose money or lose your sentence or whatever, but you can lose momentum. And I've seen a lot of people that, like, I don't know if you've seen that, um, if you've seen that, what's it called, that, like, uh, illustration or that, like, cartoon where there's, like, two guys... One of them is like right by the, like they're both digging. One of them is like right by the gym and then he turns around and come back where the other one like keeps going. And literally you could right, be like right there about the, to, to strike gold. And it's just that like one pivotal moment that you just lost momentum and, and moved away. That could be the, the thing stopping you from like exponentially growing, you know? Totally. <clears throat> and usually those little, <clears throat> excuse me, those little moments are the mentor's time to shine. Because they will give you that nugget. They'll be like, oh, dude, I remember when I was right there. This is the move I made. It didn't work. Try that. Yeah. Or this move worked and that that didn't work. Those little tweaks and adjustments along the path is how you project and, and project yourself forward. I also have a real life example. I have tons of examples of this. But one that comes to mind that's fucking kind of funny and a little bit controversial, so strap in for this one, is uh, back in the day, I, I ended up... Um, Operating and managing and running a a cockfighting breeding business. Okay. Okay. You know cockfighting, the chickens that fight each other to the death. Yes, but I've never seen it. Why? But yeah, I've heard of it. It's fucking. It's pretty gnarly. So, um, again, yeah, it's that. culture, man. It was in the Philippines, like maybe seven or eight years ago. So, this is a good example of how a mentor can help you <laughs> succeed, <laughs> because in that culture. Cockfighting is like their go-to sport, that and basketball. And they're heavy gamblers, so cockfighting is the thing. And it's just like, it's everywhere. Sundays, it's massive. And so I was there, and I was like, you know what? Like, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to go bet on these cocks that are fighting just because I want to be part of the culture. I got my local friends. Let's fucking go. Put down a couple bucks, have a beer, and like see what's happening. So I went there, and it's, it's very fucking crazy. If you guys are at home, like YouTube, Filipino cockfighting arena, you'll see the chaos. People are throwing money around. Chickens are fighting each other and stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let's get into this. And I'm like throwing money and I'm losing and I'm winning and I'm not really know what I'm doing. And like I was up like four bucks at the end or down four or whatever. I was like, that's cool. I ended up going talking to a gentleman who um, was turned out to be a very dear friend, uh, like a second father almost there. And he had a cock fighting breeding business. And I was like, that's awesome. Tell me about that. Let's let's talk about this shit. And he's like, okay, well, this is how it works. And he explained to me, as a mentor should, how it works, the steps, the way, it, like the political side of it, the ins and the outs of the business, the back end of it. And I was like, oh my God, this is super crazy shit. So I was like, well, how do I get in on this? He's like, oh, well, you can, you want to manage it for me? And I'm like, fuck yeah, I do. Let's do that. So we ended up going and he's like, okay, well, firstly, the way that it works is we go to the, the cock arenas and we make the bets with the Cocker mayor. Is yeah cockfighting arenas we make a bet with the the, the mayor and the pol politicians who were there and they're big bets hundreds of thousands of pesos right so thousands of thousands of dollars tens of thousands and so you make the bets with the politicians and then the politicians own the arena and the money that comes in from the arena from the tickets basically hedges their bet if that makes sense and then you show up and you win all the f you win a bunch because you have good good chickens and then all the people come and they're like, your chickens are amazing. We want that breed. And then you start selling them IOUs for breeds. And now you're selling chickens because you're winning. So you're, 
taking all the politicians' money because you got the best chickens, and then you're selling them all to the locals that you're there, and you move from city to city doing that. And so I learned this shit, and I go to my first fight as the manager. I walk, so picture this. I walk in the only white guy in the whole fucking community by far. It's this little town in the middle of nowhere. I go there. I have a driver. I have a guard who's carrying a machine gun. And I have another guy who's the money guy. And the money guy is walking with a duffel bag full of cash. And so we walk in through the back, go up to the top. The mayor of the city is there. The politicians are there. They're having like this feast. They're having lechon, which is a pig. They're eating all this beautiful food and shit. And they're like, okay, you know, this is the bets. These are the things that are happening. They start doing the thing. And I kind of like stand back and let them all do their thing. Chickens fight. The whole thing happens. It goes overnight. It's like a 12, 15 hour ordeal. It's a shit show. Yeah. And then chickens are winning. Chickens are losing. I don't know. We, we did okay. We kind of broke even ish on that one. It was the very first one and we left. And then on the way out, uh, my, my chicken guy, cause there's also a chicken team that's there, uh, with like 50 chickens that are fighting and like a team of 10, 10 humans taking care of it. <laughs> They're selling IOU chicken tickets. And so we, when we get in the convoy, there's a van and a truck. We get in there and I'm like, what the fuck was that? Right. I'm like 15 beers deep and I'm kind of like, what the hell just happened? And they're like, yeah, sir. So here's the cash. You know, we, we 50% increased on our cash here. We sold 77 tickets for the chickens and, um, you know, we got the in for the next city and the mayor's waiting for us. And it's on like the 14th of March or whatever, like 45 days away kind of thing. And we need to bring a team of 10. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so again, to wrap it up, mentor experience was that big money, politicians, the whole thing. Me doing it on my own was me throwing a dollar here and a dollar there and just being in the crowd like a fucking idiot. Very drastic, different experience. Yeah. Mentor got you in and showed you what's up and put me on the path to success. If I wanted to build that business, I could still be doing that now. Yeah. But I, I kind of bowed out after the second or third fight because I didn't, it wasn't really for me once I saw the ins and the outs of it. Um, but that's the power of a mentor, man. It can set you up. That's awesome. Now, anyone, <laughs> anyone wanting to, uh, to start in the uh, cock, what is it? Cock, what is it? What cock is it? fighting. Cock, cock fight. fighting. Please reach out to Aaron as Instagram no. as uh, Aaron Please was not it today. And just say how to cock fight and uh, oh, oh, we'll take care of you. <laughs> no. Oh God! So is that is that the next business we're getting to? Is that what's happening right now? Man, I that that ship has sailed. I did that business. <laughs> it was fun while it lasted, or when it was happening. It's still going on. They're still very successful at it. So let me ask you a question now. That guy, the 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 businessman, whatever that operated that business. Do you believe yeah. that this was his passion, or do you believe he just realized that you know what there is a fucking opportunity here to maximize and I'm. I can make, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of pesos. And there is this whole thing. He figured that out. And he said, fuck it. I'm going into this business. Yeah, man. I, I think, um, I think a bit of both for him. Okay. Because the cockfighting itself, okay. most men are quite passionate about it there. Okay. Right. It's kind of like in Canada. I'm Canadian, right? I'm from British Columbia, Canada, born and raised, you know, in a small town, uh, blue collar town and, Everybody in my town loves hockey. Yes. Like it's fucking hockey. So there it's cockfighting. So it's sort of in the in the genes to love it, okay. but also definitely spotted a business opportunity and leveraged the network and the resources at his disposal to create a business sort of inside part of his passion. I wouldn't say he's in love with chicken fighting, but he definitely enjoys the, the experience but he definitely found a, he found a groove there. Yeah. Okay. Opportunity. So then those that are watching right now that want to start a business, because, you know, you hear the saying, like, you know, you've got someone, I love him or hate him. I fucking hate his voice. But you have Gary V talking about, you know, <laughs> you've got Gary V talking about how, you know, find your passion, find what you're passionate about. If you find your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. I agree with that 100%. But for the person starting out, the person that, you know, is a stay-at-home mom, person that is, you know, that hates their job, they're in a nine-to-five, they want to trans, you know, transition into something, they want to start their own thing, someone that's interested in, in starting an online business or a business in general or whatever, mm. should they strict themselves to their passion 
or should they like how 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 would you go about this? I mean, you yeah. started like you know you said you started crypto and affiliate marketing stuff. Like, was that your passion, or I mean, what were you trying to accomplish there? Fuck no, man. My passion was breaking free of my financial situation and trying to find some abundance with money. I was looking to make money, as much fucking money as I could, as fast as I could. Listen, people get caught in this passion thing. Yes, it's true. If you are in your passion, you can show up with some pretty incredible energy and push through the hard times. That being said, if you're connected to your why and you're working within a structure that can produce what you want from it, you also can show up with the same conviction, right? So the way to make money, we all know this, is to solve a problem. Find a problem and solve it. Nobody gives a fuck about you being interested and wanting to build your eco-friendly, sustainable water bottle company made from bamboo. Nobody gives a fuck that you want to do that. Does it solve a problem that I'm willing to pay my money for? That's the question you need to answer. And if you can find a solution, a solution to a problem inside something you're passionate about, that's like a bonus. But I would say first and foremost, you need to figure out a fucking way to make a bunch of money in something that you are good at, that you can leverage and you can create a high income skill around it. Like you're a great example of this. Amazon broke you free, yes. right? And set you up. You went from where you were to where you are now on the back of Amazon. Yeah. Have you ever been passionate about selling products on the internet? Have you woke up and been like, oh my God, I can't wait to fucking like search for a product. Like in the same way you wake up and you're like, oh, I love the sunrise and my dog and my wife. Like that's passion. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, whenever I get asked this question, I always say, fuck your passion. <laughs> uh, there. Okay. Here's my take on it. So when you, um, when you. When you find, try to find your passion, well, let me back up a little bit. If you've got a skill, if you were born with an incredible voice, if you, you know, you, when you were a little kid, you picked up a soccer ball and you're just awesome at it, or your father, your brother, whatever, then that's a different story, right? You, you're skilled at something and that can turn into your, your passion. For the 99.9% .9 of us that don't have a skill like that that we're passionate about, I always say... Especially when you are like, especially a lot of people that are watching this are probably in a place of like scarcity, in a place of, you know, moving away from fear, right? Or moving away from pain, I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I, what I was trying to move away from was um, I was trying to move away from being broke, from having lost $150,000, you know, uh, for from, uh, uh, you know, needing to gain the respect back of my father, right? And so I was trying to get away from this. I was in, an, in, in in a scarcity state. And when you are in a state of scarcity, I don't know if you're thinking about your passion or like the things that make you happy or fuzzy or bubbly or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. I was thinking about a way to fucking make money. 80% of the products that I launched on Amazon didn't even fucking know existed, right? Yeah. Until I did product research and found that I was like, people buy this shit. And as you said, I found a, I found a problem. People needed a solution. I solved it, and I sold it, and I made money. Now, on the other side, BJK University was a passion product, but I wasn't going into BJK University from a place of scarcity. I was going into BJK University from a place of abundance. And yeah. this is the difference that I think needs to happen for you to find your passion. I, again, unless it is like kind of like organic, as you know, it's 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 natural. It just comes to you naturally. If you want to go into like like you see a lot of um, you know like. People like people like Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or you know Warren Buffett or a lot of these guys are like giving away their their money. I bet you they were thinking about giving away their fucking money 20, 30, 40 years ago when they were just building up their shit. But then once they made the money, it's like, all right, now I'm passionate about like changing the world, truly making an impact in the world, like really leaving a, a the, making a dent in the universe. And that's something you're passionate about. But that they didn't become passionate about that until they had made all of their billions, right? Yeah. And so, I don't know, that's my take on it. Yeah, until their fucking money problems were solved. Right. They solved their money problems, and they're like, okay, well, what else do I, oh, I love like, philanthropy and this and that and clean water and whatever. Yep. Sweet. 
fucking dope. It's like when we moved to Rome, my wife and I moved there and I had the dream of like, okay, let's fucking get rich on the internet, right? I didn't know what that meant. I was just like, I know that I can go on there and find some shit to do. And I know there's money there. And I know that's what I need right now in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, I was in that position. And when, when I first went online, I tried a bunch of different stuff. Right? I was doing MLM, affiliate marketing, crypto. I was doing all these things. I wasn't passionate about any of them. I was passionate about getting out of my current situation, which was that of, I don't have money. I can't support my family how I want. And I have these big fucking goals and dreams and values and like aspirations. Yeah. And all of that shit takes a bunch of money. Yeah. No question. Yeah. And so I was like, what can I do to get the money now? And I started doing stuff. Me doing that stuff, I, I was scraping together some money, right? I was starting to make, you know, five grand a month, seven grand a month, nine grand a month. It's just, it's not a lot of money, but it's enough to pay rent, get some food and feel like, okay, something's working here. I'm not working anymore. I'm on the internet and there's some, a little bit of money coming now. Yeah. Cool. When I got to that point, we met, right? And you were like enrollment, like the enrollment department of helping students get involved, helping them break their limiting beliefs, helping them overcome their fear of starting a business. You were like, do you want to help me with that part of my passion business, BJK? And I was like, fuck yeah, I love mindset shit. I love helping people. I would love to do that. I couldn't have said yes to you if I was still at zero and didn't have any money going. Yes. I had those side things running already and I could afford to come over here and be like, you know what? I click with Bashar. He's got great vision. I love his, like, his passion for this project. He's already made millions, so I know it's not about the money. He's a true leader that way. Great. I can see value in doing this for myself because I like the idea of being an enrollment coach. I like that. I can be passionate about this. Thank you to these other little income streams for allowing me to do it. If I didn't have those, I wouldn't be able to say yes to you. Cause I'd be like, I don't know, dude, that sounds like it doesn't sound like it's verified and shit. Like, I don't know, man, I need to make money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It, so for me, that's started, exactly how it went. And when we started, it definitely was not verified. It wasn't, it was, yeah, well, uh, it was the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had just transitioned into like having the vision of wanting to impact millions of lives by like teaching things you've learned, right? Up until that point, you were doing the things you learned. You had your own mentors and you were doing your thing. And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm in a place of abundance now. I want to give back and train and teach and coach and I need help. And I was like, dude, I love the idea of that. I want to help because I was also in a place of abundance by then. I had been working online for six months. I had a little bit of money coming in and I could step in and step into my passion, which I'm fully in now, you know, fully. It's fucking awesome. It's a good spot to be in, but it didn't start that way. Hell no. Started with money. Good. So yeah. th then what do you think of like greed? Because someone listening to this, they could say, you sound like a greedy fucking bastard. Someone that doesn't give a fuck about, you know, about other people or someone that doesn't give a fuck about this or that. You're just looking out for yourself. You know? Yeah. What do you I'd say fucking, I'd say get greedy. Okay. fast. Okay. <laughs> I'd say get fucking greedy because if you're not greedy, dude. But that's, you not gotta... like, that's not the popular opinion, right? I don't give a fuck if it's popular or not. You have to get greedy for yourself. Who's going to look out for you if you don't? Yes. Nobody. And by the way, we started this fucking conversation by saying, find a problem and solve it. That's how you make your money. So technically, if you're not solving people's problems that you could solve, you're not being greedy. You're withholding. And that's selfish. Yes. Selfish and greed are not the same. If you, had, if you can find a way to solve a problem for people and they're willing to pay for it and you don't provide the service, you are being selfish. Mm -hmm. If you go provide that service and charge a lot of money for it so that they get results, they change their life, that is being greedy for you and that is being greedy for them. You're helping them be greedy by providing them a path forward. Now they can step in, get greedy for themselves, focus on themselves, stay in their lane and fucking work hard and get to a place where they're in the abundance. Now they can go find their passion and step into this other realm of, of, of consciousness where you're living every life in the position you want to be in. It all comes back to some form of greed. If you're not being greedy, you need to fucking take a look in the mirror because 
nobody's going to do the work for you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like like no one is coming to to to, to help you, and no. you can't you can't pour out of an empty cup. You know, like you have to fill up your cup first. And then what's overflowing, then you kind of pass that out there, right? Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to just keep kind of accumulating everything for yourself. But then at the same time, if you look out for other people first before you look out for yourself, that's noble, but it's not sustainable. You're going to get to a point where it's like, well, fuck, everyone else is making money. Everyone else's lives are being impacted. Everyone else's is this. Everyone else is that. You know, my life is the same, right? This is why, like, the whole, you know, the whole conversation of like people wanting to get out of a nine to five or get out of corporate, like a lot, a lot of our, you know, and I know you have these conversations a lot with a lot of our students, um, but like a huge chunk of our students come from the corporate world. I mean, I know you come from the corporate world. A lot of our executives come from the corporate world, and it's like all the all the 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 the, the cards are lined to benefit the company and the corporation, and then nothing really gets spread out. And I think that's where these big corporations kind of forget. It's like, the reason why you got there is because you cared about other people at first, but then you get to a certain level where, where you stop doing that and everything kind of points directly at you. And then this is where people kind of feel like, okay, well, I'm helping other people, but I'm not being helped. And so this is why you got to kind of be greedy at first, help yourself, and then start helping other people, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. You can't pour out of an empty cup is like the saying of all sayings, right? Listening at home, like write that shit down, put it on your wall somewhere. You cannot pour out of an empty cup. If you don't fill your shit first, you have nothing to give. And it took me a while to figure that out also, you know? Because for a long time, I was always trying to like, hey man, if you do this thing, you're going to do that thing. Hey man, you should learn this thing because it's great. Hey man, if you try that thing over there, you might get some results versus just like dialing in and going inward and being like, where are you at with your skill level, with your income? No one's coming to save you. Get your fucking house in order. Right. And when I had that talk with myself, everything flipped for me. Get your house in order. That's a powerful state statement. And there's so many fucking doofuses out there nowadays talking about fucking politics talking about like, you know, solar versus gas, talking about fucking drama on televisions, talking about the fucking other people in their lives and dramas and things around their friends and shit, looking at fucking, are they doing insider trading or are they not? Is money real? What's happening with the Fed? They're printing money, inflation, like people are like, blah, 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 blah talking about stuff. If they would fucking turn 1% of that energy in towards themselves, get a coach, get a system and fucking work. They wouldn't worry about that shit because their house would be in order. Let me ask you this. Do you feel worried about fucking inflation and politics and the fucking drama on TV? Does that enter you and make you scared or uptight in any way? If, if the news or everywhere you go didn't mention inflation, I honestly wouldn't have noticed As I, or wouldn't even know. I remember, and this was like, um, this we had just started working together maybe like six months or something like that. And, uh, you know, COVID happened and all that. And um, I remember this was literally the first time in my life. And I had lived in America for 14 years to that point. That's the first time in my life that I knew when people said red, what that meant. When people said blue, what that meant. I understood the difference between Democrats and Republicans. I like up until now, I had not even voted, you know, and I just, I, mean, I just didn't care. I was so like obsessed about my business, growing my finances, just really caring about that and, and improving my skills. And that, but that's because like the whole world literally shut down. I was like, what the fuck's going on? Maybe I need to pay attention to this. <laughs> and I remember for about six months, I got into this rut that I was in. I was in like a downfall spiral. And it was because I was focused on what's out there. I was focused on everything that I cannot control. Who's yeah. president, what the president is doing, what the CDC is doing, what this, what that, what the Demo Democrats said, what the Republican, what the Congress is doing, was this. And I was literally just focused everything out there. 
And then I don't know what it was, but it was like a pivotal moment where I just snapped out of it. And I was like, I just need to fucking focus on what I can control. And ever since then until now, like when when our when our Instagram page w was taken down a couple months ago, maybe half a dozen different people reached out to me. It's like, hey, bro, do you have enemies out there? Like, what if it's someone trying to fuck with you? And like, and I was like, okay, let's just for a second pretend that's true. What the fuck can we do about that? Nothing, <laughs> right? No. Nothing. What can we do about something? Okay, well, give me something tangible that I can do something about. I'm going to focus on that because that's something that I can actually control. Something that, who the president is, what the president, you know, passes through or vetoes, what the Congress decides, what whatever, I can't fucking control. I can go vote every four years. Let's go and do that. Outside of that, there's nothing you could fucking do. As you said, focus on getting your house in order because this is stuff that you can actually control. When you get this taken care of, magically everything else out there gets taken care of too. Absolutely, fucking Lily, it does. It's a fucking clown show out there. It's like, you know, neither of us are clicked into what they call the matrix, right? Like we don't follow the news. I mean, I'm up to current events. I know what the fuck's going on, but I look at it from an objective, like almost like a clown show. I look at fucking politics, current events, celebrity shit that's going on in the world. Like I know what's out there. I look at it like fucking, it's a soap opera to me. It's like, do you watch TV? It's like, no, but I know what's going on in politics. And that's a fucking soap opera to me. I don't take it seriously. I think they're all a fucking joke. They're all self-serving. They're all fucking crook, crooks. And we can't do fuck all about it. So it's like, okay, you guys do you over there. I'll, you know, poke my head out and grab some popcorn from time to time and just like laugh at the show. But it's not going to affect how I operate my life. And I think the problem, and I hear it a lot when we talk to our students before they join and when they're trying to get inside and they're thinking, I want to change something in my life. I want to be a more provider. I want to leave my job. I want to travel. They have these goals and dreams and then fear creeps in or doubt creeps in. And I say, what, what's like, what's holding you back is something, what, what came up or whatever. And I can hear them say things like, yeah, you know, the news says it's inflation, so I should probably save my money. Or, yeah, you know, this president is in right now and he's printing money like a crazy person. My dollars aren't worth so much anymore, so maybe I should hold on to them with iron fists. And my question to you is, number one, who gives a fuck what he's doing? What serves you better? Just right now in this moment, getting a high income skill where you can create a business for your family or holding on to the little bullshit that you do have based on some bullshit from the fucking news. Which serves you better? It's so obvious that getting a skill and building something you can control is hedging the inflation and the problems in the world. I would argue you better get a fucking business right now if you think that shit's true. You know what I mean? If you think inflation's bad and shit's bad, you better hurry the fuck up and get a business then because that's something you can control. You know what I mean? Very interesting point. Um, because I, I, I do see both sides of the argument, right? Yeah, and definitely. There's always... Yeah, and the reason why I do see both sides of the argument because I catch myself trying to do that. Like, let's just kind of wait. And because I've see, I've, I literally grew up in a household where my dad, until today, is still waiting on politics in Iraq to, you know, the government to get formed, the politics to get solved. And so that he could do something back there, right? Like every time I talk to him, I'm like, hey, dad, how is everything? Because I have an oldest brother that still lives in northern Iraq. How is everything there? How is, you know, oh, we're still waiting. Literally, every time I talk to him, he's been waiting for the last 20 fucking years. No. Before Saddam was, well, we're ready for Saddam to go away. And, you know, and, and you know, uh, America's going to come in and all these companies are going to come in and we're going to do all these things and blah, blah, blah. And then after it's like, well, yeah, until the new government gets formed and then the new and then elections and then this thing and then that thing. And it's like, but dude, you're literally putting your life and your livelihood and the livelihood of your family and your loved ones in the hand of someone else that you cannot control how they fucking show up for you or your family or don't even know if they give a fuck about you or your family. No, they don't know you at all. You know what I mean? Or do they care? Exactly. So it's like, it's like. As you said, 
this money, if you believe that inflation is there, then you absolutely need to fucking, like, run and, and do something with it because if you've got $10,000 in the bank today, that's going to be, like, 9500 or 9700 or 8500 next year, right? Or even less. I don't know what the fuck is going to happen, right? And so this is where it becomes very interesting how people think that by holding on to things, they're preserving or they're holding, like, they're, they're better off than letting go. And I see this problem happen with a lot of with a lot of people where like we both know that in order for you to go to the next level of your life, sometimes you have to let go of the old to open room for the new. Right? Yeah. And I think this is what a lot of people understand. But why do you think that is? Well, why do you think that a lot of people have that problem and, and get paralyzed, you know? Yeah, I th I think it's um Becoming comfortable with what you know. The no. And yeah, like fear of the unknown. You know, it's like, again, you can always take it back to like the, the old brain we have of keeping us alive, right? Like the brain knows that that worked. You're still alive. You made some money from it. It worked. It was good times. It's like, let's do that again versus... Let's try something new that is dangerous and scary and we might die. That's what our brain is saying. To us. I was just this conversation with Little Lord having before this podcast. <laughs> 100%. It's so fucking true. It shows up everywhere, right? So it's like, do we do the new thing and we might die? Or do we do the old thing and hold on to it with fucking white knuckles? It worked. And Yeah, it worked. It worked. Let's fucking do it again. Yeah, exactly. So times change. Things change. Markets change. We change right? You change at home. Everything changes every day. You just have to have the courage to step into it. And again, you can circle right back around, find a mentor. We were talking about it. And I was like, I don't know if we should do this thing, bro. And you're like, well, let's go find some people who've done it. I'm like, that's a great fucking idea. Let's take our own medicine, right? Let's go find people who've done the thing. We're doing that. We'll see what they have to say and we'll make an informed decision. So that's, that's how you do it. You get over the fear of change and something new, you have to bypass the mammalian shit here that's like in the back that's like keeping you alive. You have to bypass that and you need to go out and get some some concrete, tangible information that you can make a good decision with and then just decide whether you want to do it or not. And chances are if you're scared of it and you're it's, it's fearful but it's been proven to work, you should lean right into that because that's where the area is you need to go, right? The thing you're most scared of is where you need to go. You're scared of heights, go fucking bungee jumping. So while we're on this topic, I want to ask a question here. Um, right. You know, people being afraid and stuff like that and, and about like, uh, you know, you're saying if you're afraid, like press into the fear, go into the fear, all the stuff, you know, what, what used to work doesn't work today. Uh, you got to change, you got to pivot, blah, 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 all the stuff. This is this is all awesome. The thing that that I heard maybe like a month ago or something like that is that over a million to three million jobs currently will not be here in three to five years. What are your thoughts about that? Fuck. Yeah, I'd agree probably. Um, I would say much like people wondering what they should do in a recession and defaulting to crying in a corner and holding on to their $4 versus going out and getting a business or building a skill where they can actually get money. I would say the same thing here. Jobs will be going away. Sure. Jobs will also be being created at the same time. So if you want to talk AI, which obviously that's the big hot topic right now is like, Oh my God, AI is taking all the jobs. Well, who the fuck's building all the AI companies? Maybe go learn how to code. You'll be having a fucking job for sure. Maybe think how you can use AI in your existing business to differentiate yourself so that you can solve the problem better than your competitor. Maybe figure that shit out versus crying about fucking AI coming in. Again, abundance versus scarcity. It's like, fuck, when I see AI, I'm like, oh yeah, so many things we can do with AI versus, oh, what are we going to do with AI? What do you think about it? I think it goes back to everything we've been talking about in this podcast from, from episode number one. It's about your mindset about anything, right? Yeah. Um, there is 
good and there is bad in everything in every situation and it's up to you to focus on what you want to focus on because where focus goes energy flows and so it's like i look at ai and in one breath i'm fucking freaking out because i'm like what the fuck this shit is scary but then in, in another breath i'm like dude like for example for our marketing team we have two copywriters on the team and they can now produce like three times more than they would if they didn't have AI, right? And yeah. so now I'm like, well, shit, that's going to decrease our overhead. It's going to make the company more profitable. It's going to help our copywriters to be more creative because like, like this thing is really good, man. I mean, you used it. I know you were like yeah. making all these videos and stuff like that with it. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, like you can get very creative with this stuff. It can really help you. So it's all about your thought process and your mindset about it. If you focus on the negative, that's all you're going to find. If you focus on the positive, you're going to get creative. You're going to find how this is going to help you, how this is going to, you know, improve your life, improve, improve your lifestyle. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about high level skills. Yeah. If you've got a high level skill, you will make a living. If yeah. you, you're you're a taxi driver, I don't know why the fuck you're still a taxi driver where you could turn your car into an Uber, right? And, yeah. and it's like you're ancient, you know? Yeah. Dude, 100%. Um, it's, again, you, what you focus on, you get, right? So you can look at AI. And for me, yeah, okay, part of me is scared shitless because they're going to fucking take over the human race at some point. Like the Terminator shit, that's all coming true sooner than we think of, you know? It won't be long before some robot fucking strangles a human and then it's like, oh man, we're in a movie now. So that part, that freaks me out for sure. But as far as like business and 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 generating income and creating companies and stuff, I'm super excited about it. I love it. Again, you can look at it from the lens of is it good or is it bad? What you focus on, you get. Let's talk about inflation again just for a second. It's the same fucking lens. Someone sees inflation. When you see inflation, what do you see when you see inflation? I can tell you what I see. I want to hear what you say first. Um, I see people freaking out and I see opportunities. Because opportunities. Usually, yes. Usually in, in like in bad times, people, you know, like try to contract, try to like kind of go back in their like little caves and like, you know, not want to do anything. Don't want to build their businesses. Don't want to do this. And we're out here with our, all of our, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals, fucking want to go to the moon and shit. Uh, and so I see opportunities. Fuck yeah, me too. The word that I was thinking was opportunities. Yeah. I see opportunities for us to leverage AI and expand our business reach in time of other people contracting, we expand. I see opportunities in investing. Fuck man, everybody's scared of the market. Shit's gonna go down, shit's all fucking sideways. What are we gonna do? You know, we saw that, we were looking at that graph. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we were at that event there, um, that finance event with Tony and he was showing the graph over time. And it's like the best time to get in the market is any time, as long as you're consistent with time. And so people are like, you know, scared of inflation, scared of AI, fucking scared of politics, scared of everything. And they're like, I'm going to wait for the moment. I'm going to wait for the right time to get in the market, bro. I'm going to fucking time it on the bottom. It's going down. It's like, you're a fucking idiot. If you think you can do that, Warren Buffett can't time the market, right? Charlie Munger, they cannot time the market. Nobody can. There's no such thing unless you're a fucking time traveler. So you just need to take action and get in. So when I see inflation and printing money and people scrambling and fucking blood in the streets, you know that saying, Warren Buffett, buy when there's blood in the streets. There's tons of blood in the streets right now. There's going to be so much more in the next five years. For people who set themselves up now with a high income skill that produces cash flow, there's lots of ways to do this. Obviously, Amazon is fucking an amazing one because it's the biggest company in the world. Hello, get on the back with that shit get cash inside and find ways to funnel that into where people are scrambling and, and getting scared. Yes. Right. For me, I'll be going deep into the stock market because I want to be buying companies on the cheap as they drop down over the next five years. Right. Real estate's going to be great. There's a lot of things you can do, but if you look at inflation and you look at AI as like, Oh my God, what's happening? I'm scared. You're just going to sit in a corner and cry. Yep. If you look at it from, Oh my God, there's definitely opportunity here. Get yourself some fucking cash from a skill and then get in there and you can make your family rich, yep. right? Solve some money problems, provide for the people you love, get into your passion.
Cut. Cut. <laughs> <laughs>